go over some special considerations uh, about managing insect pests in, in row rise. So we have really a, a diverse assemblage of different insects that attack rice throughout the growing season. Uh, several of these are, are directly influenced by the presence of a flood. A lot of our early season pests, like armyworms and chinch bugs, are really only a pest before you put that flood on. Those tend to really decrease in importance uh, after, after permanent flood is established. Same thing with uh, Calaspis. All these insects are not aquatic insects, so the flooded environment is not really habitable for them. The uh, contrary to that are the rice water weevils. Here's the adult, and the larvae are feed in the roots. That is a truly an aquatic insect that can't survive without the presence of a flood. So the flood is definitely going to influence how we manage pests. The exception to that uh, is later in the season, stem bores. I don't think they're real prevalent. They're a big problem up here, but they can be a problem further south and stink bugs. I think uh, management of these insects is going to be pretty much use the same approach whether you're in a, uh, a row rice situation or a permanent flood situation. So I'm not going to focus on them too much. Okay, so like I said, uh, rice water weevil is the, is the most important pest that we manage in rice in the permanent system. However, this insect requires a flood on there. The females will not lay eggs in a field unless there's a, uh, enough water there and with enough water depth. So they require an actual well-established flood. So if you're not holding water, you're not going to have problems with the rice water weevil, which is very uh, advantageous. Like I said, this is, can be a very damaging pest in, in a flooded situation. In furrow irrigated rice, if you're not holding the water there, it's not going to be a problem. However, I've seen a lot of situations where uh, talking to people that are blocking one end of that field or holding water at the bottom end, uh, it was mentioned by some of the speakers earlier. In those instances, you can have, at least in, in the bottom of the field, uh, a situation that really resembles a permanently flooded scenario. And some of my colleagues at Mississippi State did some good work over the past few years looking at that. And what they saw is you do have rice water weevil infestations that can occur in that bottom third. In the top two thirds, it's really not going to be a problem. But damaging level infestations can occur where you're holding that water at the bottom end of the flood. They still didn't see the, the same type of infestation levels even in that bottom cut that they had in an adjacent field that was uh, permanently flooded. And so I think overall, even if you're holding some of that water, the relative importance is going to be greatly reduced of, of rice water weevil in this situation, um, which is, is a good thing. But brings up the question of do we still need insecticidal feed treatment to manage this pest in, in row rice? So insecticidal seed treatments have really become the foundation of our rice water weevil management program. And we may still need to continue to use them, but it's not really clear at this point until we have some more data. At our trial, we did at St. Joe, where we were just flushing it and not holding any of that water. We pulled 80 core samples and found one single weevil larva. We didn't see any advent advantage of the seed treatment. However, uh, that may be different if you're holding the water. And in Arkansas, they're currently recommending the use of some insecticidal seed treatment, really regardless of how you're managing water. But I think it's not necessarily uh, the rice water weevil that's driving that recommendation. It's more uh, some other insect pests that can be problematic. One of those is armyworms. Armyworms can be uh, damaging by defoliating rice early in the season. And if you're not going to put a permanent flood on that, defoliation can last longer into the growing season and maybe potentially more damaging. However, rice is 
pretty tolerant to that early season defoliation, and a lot of times you can grow through that and not actually lose yield by harvest. Uh, Dermacore is the seed treatment that's going to have activity against armyworms, but we'll have to see what, what the economics there are and how prevalent these infestations are, because that's uh, one of the more expensive seed treatments. Another one that's important in Arkansas is the Calaspis, or grape Calaspis. This is going to be a risk uh, following soybeans. In other rotation systems, you're probably not going to have to worry about this pest. As other, uh, this insect is not aquatic. It doesn't tolerate flooding well, so it's probably not going to be an issue if you're holding water. If you're just flushing it, I think you may see problems, particularly early in the season, and reduce stand. And so for these, Cruiser and Nipset are two neonicotinoid seed treatments, are effective, but the Dermacore is not. But really what we're seeing as the big New emerging pests in this row rise system are bill bugs. I think uh, historically this was treated like a very sporadic and unimportant pest. It was just on the levees. I think they probably didn't even have the same species we're seeing now. Uh, but we're seeing widespread infestations in row rise, particularly in Arkansas, but in northeast Louisiana as well. And because it hasn't been a, an important pest historically, there's been very little research done. It's been pretty neglected from that standpoint, but it's, it's an area we're getting into now. So the larvae are the, really the more damaging stage. Those adults will uh, feed on rice, but it's the larvae that feed inside the base of the stem. If you can see that powdery sawdust-like brass material is, is really uh, clear giveaway. They cause a symptom real similar to the stem board, which is a blank canicle or a whitehead. This essentially results from the disruption of the flow of nutrients from the roots up to the, to the flowering part of the plant, which prevents that grain from filling. However, we think you're probably getting uh, injury that doesn't always cause these whiteheads. Earlier in the season, they can cause dead pillars that aren't quite as visible. So there may be more, uh, more factors contributing into potential yield loss from these pests. This feeding of the larva, and if you cut those stems open, you'll find these rather large white grubs, almost always occurs within the first two inches from the soil surface, or even uh, an inch below feeding near the, the root base. And so, uh, that feeding behavior is why they hadn't been a problem in a permanent flood situation, but they're developing into a potential pest issue here. So we did a trial to see what different uh, products we could use to try to control bill bugs and what their impact on yields were. Uh, we included a lot of our standard seed treatments alone and in combination, along with some more aggressive things. We had Cruiser at a eight times the labeled rate. Uh, Dermacore at a, at a double rate, and we also included a foliar application, Belay, this is a product that's labeled for use in rice for rice water weevil, and along with an untreated control. And this was a, a rice tech hybrid that we planted up here at the St. Joe station. And here's what we saw on the y-axis, this is our whitehead counts per meter squared and our seed treatments along the bottom. Most of the uh, standard seed treatments alone didn't really provide good control. Here's a uh, cruiser. Nipset actually had greater levels of whitehead than the uh, non-treated control. We got a little bit better activity when we used our really aggressive uh, seed treatment where we had the 8x rate of Cruiser and the double rate of Dermacore. Those are off-label and probably not affordable, but uh, did demonstrate that seed treatments in some cases can be aggressive, but most of our standard treatments didn't provide any real appreciable control. Here's the foliar belay. We got about 
reduction in those whitehead injury with that. I put that uh, application out and I checked a bunch of fields, uh, checked all the plots for potential infestations and I didn't really see anything that was at like the late killering uh, just prior to pinnacle initiation stage. But I think that product must have held, held on some activity. So once those build bugs came in, it was still providing some control. So that is one approach that, that may be uh, already available to us, but still needs to be developed a little more. Uh, here's our yield data with our pounds per acre on the y-axis and those same treatments. Here, our lowest yielding plots were the nips that treated, where we had those really high numbers of whiteheads. Uh, Belay was the highest. And when we do a correlation, uh, it's a pretty strong fit here, so I think there's a good chance this yield response is directly to the bill bug and not some other pest we were controlling here. Uh, taking all that together, what we learned from the trial, seed treatments really aren't effective. Uh, they can provide some benefit, but it appears to be minimal. Belay up at a four ounce per acre rate, which is a labeled rate, uh, appears to be fairly effective if you can time it well. And we saw uh, potential for some pretty significant yield losses, 10 to 20 percent under naturally occurring infestations. And based on that correlation, we're thinking it could be 400 pounds of rice loss per acre for every one of those whiteheads per meter squared. And this is just one trial, so we need to get some more data on this to see if this relationship holds true. Uh, but that's what we saw last year in St. Joe. Where are we going to go from here with bill bugs? Uh, we've got a lot of work planned. I've got a new master's student starting. Uh, he's actually a, a young man from Oak Grove, Wade Putman. He's going to be working on a, a bill bug project. We're looking to do some surveys of commercial fields, see how prevalent these infestations are. Are they occurring in every field, or is it spottier? And what fields tend to be more at risk? We're going to continue to examine potential for yield loss. Uh, that was encouraging with the belay that we may have a foliar application that can provide a protected uh, treated plots for comparison there. And we're also going to look at potential for sampling. I think it's going to be, it's not going to be an easy approach. Uh, in order to find them, you basically have to be crawling on the ground, cutting plants at the base. Once you see that white head, which is real visible, that's going to be too late to, to really make any management decisions. And so, and the last thing we're going to look at is some of the pest biology. When is rice becoming susceptible? How long are they developing? What are the adults feeding on? And some of those more basic questions that haven't been answered by, by previous studies. So that, that's all I've got this morning. I'd like to thank the board, uh, Rice Research Board, for their funding and the staff at, at the St. Joseph Station, as well as my colleagues and uh, grad students and colleagues at other universities. I communicate with my counterparts at Mississippi State and Arkansas, and we regularly share information. They're dealing with bill bugs there as well, so it looks like it's, it's an emerging pest across the southern region in, in row rise. And with that.